Hey guys, this video is about how to make sure your RGB SCART cable has the proper components inside. This video is going to focus on the sync components, but if needed you could use this method to test all of the RGB components inside as well. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just testing output voltage, and in most cases you can't even just look inside the SCART head, as the components can sometimes be in the DIN side of the connector, um, or even sometimes the cables themselves could add resistance or change the properties of the signal. So, as a result, you'll actually need a multimeter to do these tests. But, the good thing is, these things are cheap. Um, the one that I use is about 20 years old. Um, the ones that you could find now for about $10 will work. Pretty much as long as it has the continuity test symbol on it, you'll be able to make sure that this will work with your uh, cables. And really all you'll need is just basic continuity test and maybe voltage depending on it. So let's show you where to start. First, you'll need to know what the required components are. For this demonstration, I'll be testing the sync line on Genesis 2 RGB SCART cables, so I'll just reference the C-Sync page in my site. It says I should expect a 470 ohm resistor on the sync line, as well as a capacitor ranging from 10 microfarads to 220 microfarads. And just for the record, you'll often see that written as UF, but it's microfarads. Um, if you need to test other components, such as what's on the RGB lines themselves, you'll just need to look up what's right for each region and console uh, relation to your cable. So, for example, if you needed to test the RGB lines on a SNES cable, you'd look up, you know, NTSC, SNES, RGB uh, cable requirements. Um, but for us, uh, all we need to know is the 470 ohm resistor and 10 UF to 220 UF, and let's go from here. So I have here everything set up so you can see the pins on each side of the cable as well as the multimeter. And just start out by making sure your multimeter is set to continuity test. And then let's just test the ground of the cable just to make sure everything's working. So you can see the ground is causing the beep and then there was pretty much nothing uh, on the meter. So let's test the sync pins themselves. Uh, the SCART sync pin is always going to be this one right here. Um, this is uh, on every SCART cable where you will find the actual sync signal and for the Genesis I believe it's this one right here. So let's just test them together. We're getting nothing and as you can see also nothing on the meter. So okay let's pop this thing open and go from here. So we'll start by simply unscrewing the SCART head itself. Then in order to open it up you have to pull right in the middle of this connector and it's going to feel like you're breaking it but you're really just popping the plastic loose. And there you go. So if we flip it over uh, you could actually see that uh, the capacitor is right here and it says 220 so that should work and then there's also a resistor here. So now let's start testing that. So now that we have the SCART head open, we can see right on the label of the capacitor itself that it's labeled 220. So this is definitely within spec of the cable and it's exactly what you would need. But in order to check resistance, you can't just read the value of the resistor on the board, you actually have to measure. And of course you can't measure from the actual sync pin because much like before, the capacitor will isolate the signal. So what we have to do is test by the input of the capacitor to the pin in the inside. And you can see that that registers at just over 400 ohms, which is perfect for this cable because um, although 470 is the exact thing that we calculated, um, there's a pretty wide range when it comes to, to things like this. So having 400 should be definitely good enough. The issue is, not only do you have to measure to get resistance, um, but you can't just read because there could also be a resistor in the DIN side of the cable itself, or on some cables, the actual uh, coax creates its own resistance. So just to show that, I'll go on the input side of the resistor, back to that pin, and it registers 330. So either the cable itself is 330 ohms resistance, or there's a, a resistor in the head here. So pretty much that's it, but I just want to show a little bit more about um, what else to look for in these situations. So this is a different RGB SCART cable, and instead of having a PCB on the inside, it shows what you'll find more commonly in these, which are components directly soldered. 
And once again, um, there's a capacitor here, so I'm going to test from point to point. And it shows up at about 75 ohms. So that's not good. We actually need to rewire this one, and I'll show you guys how to do it. So we'll start just by pulling away the resistor, which is looks like it's glued into place. Uh, then you could probably see that there's actually glue on the lines here, which is a little bit hard to get off, but it's not too bad. We should still be able to get to it. Now that I pulled some of the glue off, I'm just going to touch my soldering iron to the, uh, where the capacitor goes into the scarp pin, and that comes right out. I'll actually be swapping out the capacitor as well as the resistor. To be honest, using a 6.3 volt capacitor is perfectly fine, and I certainly wouldn't say that you should swap it out, but this cable is about 3 years old, and in this case a bigger voltage is always safer, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to spend a few pennies more and swap it out with a brand new, larger 16 volt capacitor. Definitely don't feel the need to do the same on yours though, but I'll be adding a brand new 220 microfarad 16 volt cap as well as the 470 ohm resistor to this cable. So let me just clean this up and solder it all together. The only thing that you should know is that the side with the gray stripe on it is output. Pretty much other than that, nothing really matters. You could just follow it exactly as you see it here. So now that I have the resistor and the capacitor attached back to the sync line, once again with the gray stripe facing on the output side, I'm just going to take a heat gun and uh, seal this thing with some heat shrink tubing just to isolate it. So now just the final step. Everything was pre-tinned before, so we should just measure out about how much it's going to be. So it's probably safe to leave about that much. And I'm going to turn the, the capacitor head inward because the outside, uh, it's okay if it touches something. Um, luckily there's nothing here other than more insulation and other sealed wires, so we don't have to worry. But I'm going to add a little bit more solder to the actual scarp pin itself. And it's just the same pin that we removed it from. And now, I'm just going to insert the capacitor. So now that we have the new components in place, I'm just going to do the exact same test again. I'm going to go on the input side of the capacitor to the sink pin on the cable. And as you can see, we're registering about 470, so this is absolutely perfect. The one last scenario I'd like to show is when you find circuits inside the SCART head. Now don't worry, no cable manufacturer has ever left a circuit flopping around in this, at least none of the good ones. I just soldered this in really quickly to demonstrate what you might find. Most likely you'd find it surrounded by heat shrink tubing. But anyway, to the point, there are pretty much three types of circuits you'll find, and only two of them you should leave in. This one right here is a sink separator, or a sink stripper as some people call them. Basically, this is designed to take Luma or composite video on the input side, and then output only C-Sync. These are fine if you need them. Um, generally speaking, you might find another sync stripper in the chain, such as when using the G-SCART switch. But as long as they're installed properly, everything's fine. And you can see right here, there is a 470 ohm resistor on the output side. Um, so obviously, just make sure that um, they're isolated well, either covered in heat shrink tubing or whatnot. But basically, it's just the input signal, either CVBS or Luma, power and ground are hooked up, and then outputting to a resistor, output into sync. Now, the other thing you might find, which is actually not good, but as you can see, looks almost identical, is an amplifier inside. So, 
there are many reasons why people used to use these, but basically it's just best if you find them to remove them. Uh, unfortunately, these things really look, I mean, almost identical. So you're really going to need to either use a magnifying glass or the trick that I use is take a picture with your smartphone and blow it up. And you'll need to read the numbers off of these. But generally you'll see LM1881 for the sink stripper in THS 7314 or 7316 for the amplifier. So basically if you see either of these, um, just make sure it's the right chip. But the biggest issue is that you can't even measure these at all. So even if you go to the, um, the same setting, um, you can measure it on the input side, but obviously it's not gonna show any resistance. Um, uh, but the output side doesn't work at all. Uh, it completely isolates the signal. So once again, you, this is a visual inspection. You won't even really be able to test this other than making sure that the output side has the correct uh, 470 ohm resistor in it. And the last scenario is something I don't have here to show. It's another circuit that looks similar to the other two, but it's actually a logic gate or buffer. You'll only really see these in a Genesis cable, and it does pretty much the same thing as the cap and resistor. If you have one of these, you can leave it in, but just make sure there is a resistor on the output side that's between 470 ohm and 1 kilo ohm. It's actually also good practice to have some kind of resistor on the console side, but it's really not critical and certainly not as important as the rest. All right, well now let's show you how to button these things up. If you've never reassembled a SCART cable, it can be a little bit tricky the first time. And the most important things to remember are to line up this ledge right here with this divot inside the SCART head. Um, so all you have to do is aim the far side away so that sink pin uh, is, goes away from you. And you try to place it right in. And then of course, make sure that none of the things that you've done or none of the cables are pinched when you put it back together. So um, luckily we used really good um, heat shrink and isolation so we don't have to worry too much about where they go. But just as I'm flipping it back over, I'm making sure that nothing's pinched. And then make sure that all of the divots are all back together. And I usually like to test by pushing in on the actual metal part itself because sometimes it'll smush back in if you weren't lined up. And then other than that, just screw that right back down and you're done. The cable's back to normal and it has the perfect sync output. So if you were just looking for an example of what to do, then that's it, uh, video's done for you. Now you could use that same method to check all the components on your SCART cables. And to be honest, I would. I mean, really, for a multimeter that's less than $10, how much work could this possibly be to just make sure that you have all the correct components? Make sure the RGB lines have the correct uh, ca uh, caps and resistors for those consoles that need it. Not all consoles do. And then same with the sync line. Just make sure everything matches up to the listed specifications. Um, overall, it's a really quick and easy thing to do, and everybody should pretty much own a multimeter anyway. If you're wondering why you have to do it this way, and a little bit more details just on how testing works and why you need to go by specs instead of just sticking a multimeter on and reading voltage, then please stay tuned. I'll try to make it as quick as possible, but if you just wanted information on how to check your cables and then how to swap out the components, you're all done and I'll see you next time. Or if you want to nerd out with me just a little bit longer, uh, please stay tuned. I'm sure many people watching this right now are thinking, well, if the entire point of checking cable components is to make sure the signal is outputting to NTSC or PAL standards, then why not just test the voltage on the outputs? Why can't I just turn on my setup, fire up a white screen, and test under load? It's a good question, but the reason is because video signals aren't a constant voltage like a battery. They're actually a waveform. A multimeter isn't designed to capture the behavior of these types of signals, so you'd need an oscilloscope to scan the full waveform. If you used a multimeter, you're not measuring what you think you are, so you'd get a misleading reading like this one, which is not at all accurate to what's coming out of the console. So let's start by checking out captures from an oscilloscope. Those yellow and blue lines are the waveforms. See how they rise and fall as they scan across the scope? That's a good visual example of why a multimeter can't properly read these signals. A multimeter is expecting a constant voltage, which in this picture would have shown up as a straight line instead of the waveform. Now here's a diagram courtesy of Steve from HD Retrovision to explain what we're looking at. 
Basically, the yellow line shows the voltages of the signal before it hits any components, and the blue shows the voltages after the components in the sync line. This picture shows the waveforms with the proper components added to the sync line of the Genesis cable. You can see that both waveforms are perfectly within the tolerance of the specs, 3.4 volts on the yellow waveform and 483 millivolts on the blue. This also demonstrates why the recommended components for Genesis C-Sync are 470 ohm resistors and a 220 microfarad capacitor. It puts the voltage smack in the middle of the tolerance, allowing for some wiggle room. In comparison, this picture shows what happens when there's only a resistor and not a capacitor on the line. As you can see, both waveforms fall below the spec. And finally, here's a scope capture with no components at all on the line, just a direct connection between the console and the SCART sync pin. So hopefully, these picture examples would give you a better idea of what the sync signal looks like, as well as why you can't just use a multimeter to test. Because as you can see, with all of the different voltages we've read in these scope captures, none of them are even close to what we showed on the multimeter when I was just testing incorrectly before. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching, and as always, any comments or criticism, please post down below. If there's any more of these videos you'd like me to make, or really something specific you were wondering, please post and I'll see if I can give it a try. As always, this video would never be possible without all the amazing Patreons that support the site and the videos, so thank you so much to all of you guys, and I'll see you next time. And then uh, this ledge on the end, fuck.